Well, hey, hey. Adventure Brad here, and uh, yeah, got butt fan. And you guys want to know how it converts this? Some dead dinosaurs into some wicked ass smiles. Let's try to give you a basic overview of how your motor runs. Um, uh, kind of, and let's try to relate this to paragliding, paramotoring, whatever, uh, in the most easeable way. So in this lovely box here, um, I wonder if I rub it, if I'll see my future, mm. um, is um, an air cleaner and air intake. Um, the whole idea behind this is, is if you, when you have an open air filter, um, that looks cool and all, but it's really not the best because we fly, you know, 22 miles an hour roughly. So you have 22 miles an hour of air flowing over your air filter. That's not good. You could potentially lean the motor out and stuff like that. That's why uh, paramotors have some sort of an air box. Uh, directs the air in, smooths it out, straightens it out, and gives it a more consistent airflow. No, no matter if you're on the ground, uh, climbing uh, with a low air speed, or if um, you're on speed bar or whatever else, it, it keeps the tune of your motor uh, in line um, or, or consistent, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And we'll explain that here in just a second. So air box um, in this area right here is an air filter. And um, hold on. Did you hold on to something? All right. So I pulled the air box off here to give you guys a uh, better idea of look at everything. So air filter, squishy, squishy. So we have the air filter here. The next thing is the carburetor. You got a fuel filter, um, fuel line that goes down into the tank. There's no fuel pump. Some people have a bulb. It's a primer bulb. Uh, they're diaphragms. There's two diaphragms. So uh, it's one acts as a check valve and well, they're both check valves. One way device is so when you squeeze, it siphons fuel through and pumps it up. Uh, the little diaphragms pop open and bypass fuel up through uh, when you're running. Um, so yeah, uh, fuel filter, fuel in. Um, can you give it away here? You need three things for your motor to run. You need uh, fuel, air, fuel as a combo mixed at 14.7 uh, fuel to air ratio. Um, and then you need compression, and what's your piston comes in handy and rings and all that. And you need spark at the right time. If you have those three things, your motor will run. It's simple as that. So uh, you take any of those three out, you rearrange them, you do something else with them, your motor won't run. So, you just need a mosquito. All right, I had to get rid of those mosquitoes. So yeah, air filtery, carburetti, fuel comes in, motor, air goes out. So a motor is basically an air pump. Um, it apps operates just like a compressor. It goes light in my misty, um, but differently. Uh, you use uh, parts. Actually, as a project as a kid, I turned a little compressor into a motor. Long story, uh, just to prove that I could to myself, I guess. Um, so yeah, you take fuel in and you mix it with air at 14.7 fuel to air ratio. Uh, you get that off, your motor won't run too far one way or another. Uh, a little bit off, it'll run fine. Uh, but that's generally um, the optimized fuel ratio for most motors, unless you're going... Yeah, never mind, I won't get into that. Um, so air comes in here, fuel comes in here. The carburetor is just a mixing device. Um, it's dumb. All it knows is throttle position. So if I squeeze the throttle, I see that? Pulls the cable. And what that does is there's a butterfly in there. So there's just a venturi or a, the throttle bore is just a venturi with a step in the middle of it and a butterfly. In the case of my carburetor, because I have a top 80, I have a choke, which is a really awesome feature for many reasons. So you have a venturi effect. Well, as pilots, I hope you guys know what the venturi effect is. Um, if you're a free flight pilot, you definitely know what it is. But it's uh, as you force air against, like you see, I have a slope or my face right here. As you force air against it and it comes over, you get a high pressure zone against the one side because all that air is stacking up and it can't quite go over in time. Uh, well, 
as that air comes over the mountain or the step in the carburetor, the neck down area, the throttle bore, it comes over the backside and as it comes off the backside, you get one rotor, which is why they call it like the death, uh, the, the death demon zone. You don't want to be behind obstacles. Well, two, it's also a lower pressure air because now all that air is expanding, like how you blow air out of a, uh, um, these things and they get cold. Um, the tip of it will get cold after a second. Well, it's because air is expanding. It takes heat away. Blah, 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 blah. We're not getting into physics. Uh, but because of that, that low pressure system changes, and we're not going to get into that either uh, because this is just an overview, but it changes the metering in the carburetor so it allows it to pump more fuel uh, or uh, it allows more fuel to go in to match um, the air that you're adding in because when you open the throttle, you are adding air to the system so you need to add fuel to match it and that's how the carburetor knows because there's no physical link between the throttle position and anything in the carburetor it's not like a carburetor like on a car most cars nowadays are fuel injected but see all that mechanical linkage that goes to the throttle berries throttle bodies and the secondary and stuff you don't have that stuff on our carburetors our wall unless you have a float style carburetor our wall broke diaphragm carburetors are very basic, they're very dumb. So if there's anything wrong with your metering, um, fuel flow in, if you have a clogged fuel filter, your vent cap, this is a motorcycle vent cap, I use that to um, um, keep the smell down and stuff, because if not, the smell gets everywhere. Byproduct of that is it pushes air into my fuel line, which is why my motor wouldn't run uh, when I went to go fly the other day. But, so that's, you. You all that stuff kind of needs to be in sync. So like I said, uh, if, it's dumb carburetor so if it, it's like a computer the only information you'll get out of it is as good as the information you put into it so you want to um, be running uh, everything in good shape fuel filter you don't want to make sure you have any clogs uh, that sort of thing um, that pushes the fuel in well these are a two-stroke motor there's um, two primary differences in a two-stroke motor besides a four-stroke motor uh, one into how many, uh, how much movement it takes out of the motor to make power and, and how it lubricates. Most of your conventional car motors, um, have a, a wet sump oiling system, uh, meaning there's a, a oil pan underneath of it, an oil pump, uh, oil galleys, uh, different ways for the oil to pass through and lubricate the, the critical important parts of the motor. Um, including the bottom of the piston, which a lot of people uh, kind of miss. But yeah, the bottom of the pistons need to be cooled by oil or they will get too hot. Um, so you, our two-stroke motors lubricate by you mixing oil into the gasoline because there's no uh, wet crankcase to... There's no sump here. There's nothing to change oil on. My top 80, you could change oil on the gearbox that's not the crankcase oil this is separate actually the crankcase ends right here and this is a clutch uh, attached to the motor and a bell that's hooked to a gear reduction unit up to the prop so your carburetor mixes that fuel and air together along with that little bit of oil to lubricate your crankcase the like i said there's two main parts besides lubrication the other main part to a two-stroke that makes it different from your automobile motor is that it's a two stroke. So it takes two strokes, one down, one up of the piston to make one combustion cycle. One combustion cycle spins yield prop or helps to spin it around. Um, a four stroke motor takes one down an explosion cycle, one up an exhaust cycle, one down an intake cycle, and then one back up a compression cycle. Well, our two stroke motors operate differently. They don't have a valve train, camshafts, uh, valves like you're used to uh, in a motor. They're, uh, they have what's called a reed valve. So in here, there's two opposing carbon fiber plates um, in a, a V-shape opposing pattern on a, a block, or it's called a reed block, but it's a plate, or it's just a support area that works just like a diaphragm, uh, one-way check valve like we were just talking about, but it only lets the fuel and air go into the cylinder. So the way this works is your piston's at the bottom. Your crankcase is open. This whole area is open to the bottom of the piston. When the piston comes, starts to come up because of the, the mass of the inertia of the flywheel and everything coming around, 
it starts doing a couple of things. The first thing it's doing is it's, it's starting to compress the fuel and air mixture that is in top. Well, as it's compressing the fuel and air mixture coming to the top of the piston, it's creating a low pressure in your crankcase. That low pressure draws in through the reed valve the next gulp of fuel and air. It's a, it, so it's using that bottom of the piston, the inertia of the motor spinning over to draw in that next gulp of air. Uh, that's where it's really important on these motors, not to have any sort of a crankcase base gasket, uh, crankcase flange, uh, the seal leaks, anything like that. It's not like um, your car where it's only important for the cylinders and heads to be sealed and it just leaks on the ground. It's not an old Harley or an old Jeep. You can't do that uh, because on that intake cycle, it's gonna suck in air out at a disproportionate ratio to that 14.7 that uh, you're, you're, so you could be chasing a carburetor problem and in reality, it's a crankcase problem because you have a leak here, it's leaning your motor out. If it gets too far away from you, you will seize the motor up. Uh, you'll cause hot spots in the motor because it's not lubricating, everything's not mixing the way it should. So yes, yeah, so you're, you're, the motor's coming around, the piston's coming up in the cylinder. Um, as it comes up to a certain point of the cylinder, it shuts off the exhaust port and the crossover ports, which I'll get to in a second, are direct open into the cylinders. There's no valves or anything in their way. What acts as the valve is the pistons itself. So it comes up, it shuts the crossover ports off, shuts the exhaust port off. Then the top part of, it's not the full stroke like in a normal four stroke car, the top part of the stroke is the, the compression area of the stroke. So after it shuts those two ports off by just going right by them, uh, you're using the skirt as the valve. The outside round part of the piston is called the skirt. It's the valve. The top part of the piston, oh, squinch, compresses. Now, this is the cool part. You need ignition. Remember we talked about those three magical things? We need fuel and air at the right time. We need compression, which we had just achieved. And we need spark at the right time. Uh, we're not fuel and air at the right time. You need uh, fuel and air at the right ratio, excuse me. So down in here, we have this flywheel. On the flywheel, there's a, a magnet mass. Well, that magnet mass passes by this coil. There's not, they say coil, but it's actually a coil. So there's a primary and a secondary coil. Um, there's electromagnetism, ele electricity and magnetism are the same word in physics. It's called electromagnetism. Magnetism. So if you take a coil of wire and you wave a magnet by it, that coil of wire will generate a pulse of electricity. Well, that's what you just did with the spinning flywheel. It spins by the front of that coil. The, you got the two sides of it, and we're not going to get too complicated here, but it pretty much it makes a small charge. Well, you have a primary and a secondary coil. Your primary coil jumps the voltage up uh, to the secondary coil, and then you have their secondary wire, which comes up and it fires the spark plug. The spark plug is grounded through your motor case back to the coil. So that's how you get the sparks to uh, that's how you get a spark to travel is this is one side of the wire the other side of the wire is your motor now this is a real key thing and I want to take a second to cover here it's a safety issue this little wire here and it comes up you know it goes down and around and it comes out my throttle and hooks to here this is kill switch this is most how most people are familiar with killing their motors killing your motor kill switch is the typical way to do it but because of the way these coils work, they don't work on you adding power to them um, uh, to uh, run a point to condenser or to run electronic condition. So if you just shut that power off, it'll run. Um, meaning if it went with some sort of system like that, if anything died between here and there, it would just shut your ignition off and you'd have to do a forced landing, uh, which in a way is kind of bad with paramotor. But if this wire comes loose, and you notice mine's covered in silicone, it's had it's been a long way, but uh, I've actually seen it a couple times now where that wire's broke loose and that one guy on the ground kind of like a little panicking, oh, I can't shut my motor off. Well, yeah, and I was afraid to walk up on him because he's kind of a, I don't know what he's gonna do kind of guy, like he doesn't, I don't know. He's got a prop on his back, so I'm just not gonna wander up to him. But yeah, if that wire falls loose, your motor won't shut off. You need to have that in your head, what you're gonna do. Do you have some sort of primer system? Just prime your motor, richen it up to kill it. You have a choke system like yield top 80s, just choke the motor. It'll richen it up, kill the motor. Um, 
Yeah, we're not going to give that. It's going to be a whole other episode of what to do there. So anyways, your spark comes in. That gives it the fire. Bam! You get this massive explosion. Your fuel and air at 14.7 just went off. It's sending that piston back down, turning that crankshaft through the clutch, to the gear set, to the propeller, to your face. Oh, but there's more. But wait. So how do we repeat that cycle? I explained to you one stroke, the piston coming up, the drawing in air to the crankcase, the shutting the exhaust and crossover valves up. Oh, crossover valves. I know you guys are wondering about those. So the crossover valve shut off and you were compressing the fuel and air. Well, that stuff just blew off. Cool. So now as the piston is coming back down because it's a reciprocal cycle, the piston's coming back down, it opens that exhaust port meaning the piston drops below the exhaust port the skirt is no longer covering it it opens up and that expanding fuel and air mix could go out but this is kind of the trick of a two-stroke they're not efficient uh remember while we talked about we just used top the top part of the compression stroke um we're not drawing in on the full stroke because <clears throat> there's not exhaust stroke meaning we're not going to be as efficient overall in our burn but we can make power twice as quick. The coolest thing about two strokes is you don't have all that valve train. You don't have gear shaft or camshafts, rocker arms, lifters, timing chains or belts or anything like that associated uh, intake and valve. It, they're very simple. So um, to help help that process out versus this just being a pipe and no, they didn't spend all this time welding because they thought it looked cool. There's a trick to this. There's a congerent and a degerent cone. So as that exhaust comes out, it comes out in the congerent cone and bounces off the degerent cone. So you have, this expands, this is a congerent cone. Well, inside of here, there's the degerent cone. Well, the wave hits that and comes back and hits here. And it comes back and hits here, and hits here, and hits here. And it creates what's called a standing wave. Well, you tune, everyone talks about a tuned pipe and how two strokes go on on pipe. Well, what's happening there is that conjure and a degerent comb bouncing that sound wave back and forth like they were playing badminton. Well, not, I guess that's a bad analogy. But they're bouncing that, the conjure and a degerent comb back and forth together. Well, that stuff gets in harmony and it gets a standing wave and it comes back up and it starts traveling up the exhaust pipe and it hits the back of the piston. Well, if you're timing and if you've tuned your exhaust right, at the RPM, you want this thing to mo make most horsepower. That standing wave is now reaching into that cylinder and scavenging the exhaust gases out. So it's helping to get all that burnt fuel and air back out. Because as that piston comes down, the next thing it does is opens over these crossover ports and they're kind of hidden on this motor. They're, they're really kind of hard to see, but they're here. They're, they're, there are these little bulges here and there's some on the front, but those are the crossover ports. And what they do is they hook the crankcase where we remember how we earlier we filled up all that fuel and air mixed up in a crankcase under vacuum. Well, now as we're coming back down, that piston's coming down on top of the piston and it's putting our crankcase under a positive pressure now. Well, just as it, and it's not a huge, it's nothing compared to the vacuum on the intake stroke, but the positive pressure, oh, and it, once that piston, the, your standing wave and your tuned exhaust just is scavenged as much exhaust as you can out, it, it's the standing wave, you, you want to tune it right so the standing wave is not there anymore. So when the crossover tube, crossover ports open, and the same thing as the exhaust port, the skirt opens past them, all that fuel and air that's now under compression runs up the side of those crossover ports onto the top of your piston. And if there's no vacuum here, but it was vacuumed out earlier by scavenging the fuel and air out, it's a perfect prime environment because you have comp pressure in your crankcase. Uh, this is your clutch crankcase here. Uh, it's pushing that fuel and air up. It's been scavenged out. So roughly you have a hopefully pretty clean combustion area or, or yeah the top of your cylinder there and you're forcing all that fuel and air up on top um it's able to repeat that cycle so fuel and air goes up on top piston hits bottom dead center the crank take comes around again because it's a reciprocal rotating cycle uh well yeah um the uh once it hits the bottom again it's this is hit maximum pressure the piston starts returning back up as it's coming back up, that last little crossover gases come out and it gets shut off, 
going up again. This is the inefficiency in two strokes. Remember how the, the exhaust port opened first on the compression stroke and then it was the crossover ports? Well, your crossover port shut off first. The exhaust port's still open. So a lot of that fuel and air mix is going right out, unburnt, out your exhaust. And that's where they get that, where, where two strokes, they, they won't pass emissions because they're sending so much unburnt. It, it, it's kind of a necessity of the beast. It, the better tuning you could do is what you're trying to eliminate there. But that port's still open for a moment in the cycle. So as it comes back up, as a, the, the crank rotates further along, it shuts that valve off eventually, but it gets out. Then again, it comes back up, you're creating that negative pressure in your crankcase, the negative pressure is drawing more fuel air in, uh, both those ports get shut off, cylinder hits, comes at top dead center. You don't fire the spark plug at top dead center, you fire it advanced of top dead center, uh, a certain degree, so then that way everything's really trying to explode before it hits top dead center. The more rompy the motor, you have the generally more advanced it's firing it so it's really like continuing to burn uh, because when you're compressing that stuff still you get auto ignition and it really helps be as efficient as possible and burn all the fuel you can off so bam that fires back out fuel and air mix back in the cycle repeats so this is all hooked to your crankcase or crankshaft crankshaft comes out to a clutch system the clutch system is just two shoes they're a lot like brake shoes on your car not brake pads brake shoes but they're hooked to a flywheel. Um, roughly, these are pretty low mass, low weight flywheels, but those shoes are held in close together as springs. Uh, as you RPM it, uh, inertia pushes them out, and so they wanna go out. Well, they go out and they hit your clutch bell. The clutch bell's in here. It's hooked to a small beveled gear, another, oh, well, spur gear, excuse me. Spur gear, spur gear, uh, and it comes out your crankshaft. If you have a uh, belt-driven motor, um, you, you, well, if you have a clutch belt driven motor, it'll operate the same, but, but versus two gears, you would have two pulleys. Uh, this causes, so my prop rotates this way because you're running opposite gears. This one will rotate the opposite direction. My motor is cranking over like this. It's easy evident by the pull start coming up on that side. Cause it's pulling up from this side of the motor versus this. So the motor rotates like this counterclockwise from looking at it from the back. Um, Pulley, pulley to pulley style belt driven motor will be the same. Now I have a question for you guys. It's a physics question. What makes your paramotor actually go? And I just gave you a big hint, but yeah, I want you to answer down in the comments. Let me know what you think. It's not actually dead dinosaurs. Uh, it's not YouTube, it's not Instagram, but what makes your paramotor go? What makes it fly? Um, yeah, answer that for me and yeah. So yeah, um, I hope you guys gained something about it, made some sense to you on how a paramotor works, gained a little knowledge. If you guys like this style of video, you want to see more, you want me to go into more depth about one part of it, give me a holler, write the comments down there, and yeah, you guys fly safe, fly within your means. Remember, this is a sport it's supposed to, you know, be fun, be a hobby. Immerse yourself in it. Don't just be like, oh, I'm good enough to go fly and go send it. No, dive into it. Learn how, you know, you don't have to learn how a spark plug's made, but learn how it works. Learn how it's, uh, how to read it. And that's one video we're going to have real quick here soon uh, is, yeah, how to read your plugs, how to deal with a flooded motor, all that sort of thing. But immerse yourself in the hobby, folks. Dive into it, breathe it, understand it. Um, understand what oil I should run because, you know, it's a dumb question. It gets asked a lot, but you, you know, just, just understand it. Not just ask everybody. Um, spark plugs, gaps, what, what, what's a different gap matter? Um, but like I said in the beginning of this episode, understanding how your motor operates will add to your enjoyment, add to your relaxation, minimize maintenance costs, and yeah, just add to your smiles. So happy flying you all. You have a great day now.